All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another exciting day in the world that is CS107. Uh, a couple announcements before we get, get into the material today. Uh, first and foremost, basically it's all assignments from uh, announcement wise. Assignment one, grades and feedback went out over the weekend. They went out on Saturday. Hopefully you got a chance to take a look through that and got some useful comments that you could hopefully apply to your assignment too. Um, also, you know, maybe this is the first time that many of you will have seen the automated testing process, um, the, you know, the grading that we do here in 107 being, in terms of functionality, being primarily based on the output of your program being automated. Um, there are, there's information on the website that hopefully you've all seen already about how we do the grading and, and that process, but uh, historically maybe there are some, there are the occasional surprises as to what the automated grading was able to find that you were or were not able to find in your own code. Um, so hopefully that gave you a bit of a sense of what testing is like and the kind of robustness and the and stress cases we're, we're looking at and you know, how, how thoroughly we test your program. So moving forward, we have assignment two coming in to tonight, and we've got assignment three going out shortly thereafter. All right. So let's get into it. Before I start on the actual content for today's lecture, I do want to give you a bit of a sort of a roadmap for what we're where we've gotten to and where we're headed toward, because we are going to be shifting gears pretty substantially today uh, from what we've been doing. And I, so I, I want to put that into context and give you kind of the big picture of where we're trying to go. Up until now, we've been talking a lot about the C language. We've talked about pointers and memory, and we saw lots of interesting ways to use pointers um, to implement interesting things like strings and generics, and you're working through some kind of cool problems with uh, assignment two, for example. Now, but until now, we've been drawing memory as these kind of abstract boxes. We've been saying, okay, I've got this pointer, it's in this box, there's, there's some address in this box, and the int is represented as these four little boxes, uh, which I threw the word byte around a few times and said, oh yeah, you know, memory is stored in a bunch of bytes and ints are four bytes and pointers are eight bytes. So now we'd like to actually look at what, what's going on in the memory. We want to understand what exactly it means to store a byte, how we can interpret that byte as characters, as integers, and uh, next time as floating point numbers as well. So this is the section on data representation. And then next week, we will start on talking about, okay, well, now we can represent our data. We can represent our, 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 our variables and our, you know, our numbers. We can think about how to do arithmetic on them. Now how do we represent our code? That will be next week. Okay. So let's get into our plan for today. So the first, uh, so the plan for today is going to be, we'll be looking at this data representation, these bits and bytes, and we'll be thinking about them in three different ways. We'll start by looking, at, we'll start by, of course, defining what bits and bytes really are, um, and then we'll talk about first how we can interpret each bit kind of individually. We just think about them as actually these little like on-off switches, um, sort of tr true-false values. Um, using a set of a new set of operators called the bitwise operators, and then we'll look at how these bits can be interpreted as signed and unsigned integers. So let's start with just a few definitions. Uh, so the most uh, base, the most uh, the first one to get out of the way is what exactly is a bit? So a bit. Is, which is short for binary digit, is simply a one or a zero. So here you can see I've got this box uh, with eight bits in it. So each of these zeros and ones 
each of those is a bit. So for now, as we think about interpreting bits individually, we can think of each of these as representing true or false, one representing true, zero representing false. Um, I may use the terms on and off, or one is on, two, uh, zero is off. Um, but so, yeah. And then when we, so one bit is, is fine, and that's sort of the most basic unit of storage that we could you know, get on a computer. But when we, we can put them together into a byte, which is eight bits. So the picture there is the picture of a, of a single byte. And the reason that bytes are interesting, why, why they're, why, you know, why eight? Why have we decided to put, to pack bits in this particular grouping and, and not any other, is that bytes are the smallest unit that we can really refer to in C. So we learned already when we talked about void star that cares are a one byte type. So this box of eight bits could be stored, for example, in a care variable. And we saw that when we manipulate the addresses uh, that we would be moving through memory, like if we did you know, point arithmetic, we, we're, the unit that we're moving through is in units of bytes. So we cannot refer in C to an individual bit. We can't say, oh, I would like to read this, this particular zero or this particular one. Um, we have to refer to the entire byte at, uh, with our operation. So in order to actually think about bits as true, false, or as on off, individual on off switches, we need to learn a new set of, uh, we need to learn a new set of operators um, to, to work with them. Okay? So let me set the stage for introducing these operators. Uh, here I've declared two care variables care because, not because I actually want to store characters or because I want to interpret them as characters, but because a care is a one byte value. So you can see that I've written out these bit patterns uh, for the one byte values. Um, <clears throat> and so I have the cares uh, A and B. Um, I'm declaring them unsigned just so that I don't have to deal with anything weird about positives and negatives. And now we'd like to look at the set of operators that will allow us to work with these bits. Um, uh, okay, so the pattern that we're going to see for all of these operators is that these operators will work on the corresponding bits of A and B. So we'll start, we could start, for example, on the left, and we'll look at the first bit, or the, so this is going to be called the most significant bit of A and the most significant bit of B. And so we see that they're both zeros. And the operator will, will look at those two bits and produce some, some bit to go in that, this position. And then it will look at these two, and it will produce a bit to go in these positions. And the difference between the bitwise operators will be what combinations of these zeros and ones will produce a one or an on bit in the result. So let me just give you an example. The first bitwise operator we want to see is the AND operator. OK, so what AND does, notice single ampersand, not uh, double ampersand. So this is, the, this is the column for what the actual C code would be. This is the logical name on the left. So single ampersand, not, not double ampersand, is our bitwise AND. And what we get from this is you'll notice that in the result, which is this box, the, the resulting bit will be on, it will be one, if and only if both A and B have a one in that corresponding bit. So here you can see that both A and B have a one, so the result will have a one. But in these other three slots, even though A has a one here, because B, does ha because B has a zero here, uh, the result will be a zero. Okay, let me follow that pattern for the rest of these bits. Yeah? Okay. So we can go to another operator. This is the OR operator. Uh, the names 
try to suggest what is actually happening. So you can think of and as being, okay, if A and B are both one, then the result will be a one. Or is saying if A or B or both are one, then the result will be one. So you can see that everywhere has a one except for the two spaces where both A and B have a zero in that space. Okay, next operator is the XOR or exclusive OR operator uh, represented with this, the, the, the caret here. So this is like OR in the sense that if A or B is one, then the result will be one. So you can see that uh, here and here. But if A and B together, if A and B are both one at the same time, then XOR will be zero. So you can think of XOR as being, are the bits in, are the, is the bit in A different from the bit in B? And if it is, then we'll have a one. If it's not, then we'll have a zero. Yeah. Okay, a few more uh, bitwise operators, and then we can actually see how to use them. Uh, here I've just repeated the value for A because the last uh, three operators do not count on uh, do, not, do not depend on B at all, so I'll just repeat A. Um, the next operator is the not operator. This is tilde. Um, this is different from, for example, exclamation point. This is different from negative. Um, the tilde operator simply says, okay, take every bit in A and just flip it. So if it was a zero, put a one. If it's a one, put a zero. Yeah. And then the last two operators, which I'm introducing together, are the shift operators. So these let me take the va value for A and they, and they'll, so they take all the bits in A and they'll move them over. So with the left shift, you see here I have, I'm left shifting by two, which means that I take this one over here and I move it two spaces to the left. I take the zero and move it two spaces to the left and so on. Now two things you might notice uh, right away. So the right shift, same thing. We move this zero three spaces to the right and so on. Two things that you'll notice right away with bit shifts. First of all, we, a couple of bits kind of fell off, right? So in the case of the left shift, these leading zeros, these two zeros, aren't in the result anymore. Uh, we don't have enough space to write those two zeros because we're only using one byte values. So they, they, they go away. They, you can think of them as kind of falling off the end. And likewise, for the right shift, the 101 at the end here, these last three bits, fall off the right end. Okay. The other thing to notice is we have to fill in the sort of the holes that we've created, these, this empty space that we've created with something, right? So what do we fill them with? Well. For now, because, uh, yeah, so for now, we can say they'll basically get filled in with zeros. And we'll see that there's one exception to this. We'll see that later. But for now, we can just say that when we shift either left or right, the space that gets created gets filled in with zeros. Um, yep? Why do you need the XOR operator when you can just make that out of and and or? Yeah, so the question is why do we need XOR if we could, we could probably get this from and and or? We can. Um, we don't, so you can, Think about, so if maybe if you're from like kind of a math background, like a logic background, you can think about what sort of the minimal set of operators is. Uh, this is not a minimal set. Uh, however, it's just useful, and we'll see why. Like, so yeah, part of, sort of the next thing I need to show you is, so okay, great, I showed you all these bitwise operators, why are we using them? Why do we care? Um, there's, uh, so we don't need a separate operator, but it turns out it's actually just really useful to have. So, uh, so it's just a convenience, yeah. Unsigned, yeah, so this will come up a lot more later in the lecture, but for sort of the one sentence is that unsigned means that A and B will not hold negative numbers. It means that uh, we should interpret uh, A and B as, as, always inter as always as a positive number. And what that means in terms of when manipulating bits, so the reason we use unsigned when talking about bits is that we don't want any of these bits to be special. We want to think of each of these bits individually um, and we don't want to interpret them as numbers at all. So 
it's conventional to use unsigned when actually working with the, the raw bits of a number. Anything else? Okay. What happens to the bits that fall off? What happens to them? What happens to the bits that fall off? They just they don't get represented anymore. So if you think about like uh, the right shift of three here, there was a one, zero, and a one, and they're just they're just gone. So this is your new number, right? Five zeros, one one zero. Uh, uh. Okay. So we've seen these operators. Um, and you know the kind of like all right sure here's here's the definitions but but who cares what are we actually going to do with this to show you an example of how we're going to actually use these operators to actually make s to uh, represent these kind of on off switches that I was alluding to let me switch over to the code okay so here uh, I got to introduce a couple of new things first. I need to tell you what an, I, I'll say briefly what an enum is. This isn't super important um, for the actual bits part, but what I'm doing here is I'm defining a set of, you can think of these each as constants, um, and I'm kind of grouping them together. So here I have a, a data type that I'm trying to represent uh, the different sort of, so I'm calling these font traits. So you can think of bold italics and underline as sort of things, like properties of a, of a font. Um, you can think about mixing, ma mixing and matching them, so you could have some text that is both bold and underlined, for example. So I'm using an enum here to say that these four constants are related to each other. Okay. And, but instead of defining these constants as just sort of arbitrary numbers, you know, one, two, and three, I want to define them as each corresponding to a single bit in my, uh, so I'm only writing out three bits. You could imagine there being another five to fill out the whole byte, um, but I didn't want to write. I didn't want to write them to, to save space. So you can think. So what I'm trying to do here is I've got. I want to represent whether my font is bold using the least significant bit, using the rightmost bit. Uh, I want to represent whether the font that I'm using is italics using the middle bit, and whether it's underlined using the the leftmost bit of these three. Okay. And I'm generating these constants using bit shifts because that seems, because I want to be explicit that I want to, about what the bit patterns I'm getting. All right. And so here's some code. Um, rather than actually walk through the code kind of in person, I want to actually walk through it in GDB so that I can print some stuff out as we go. So I'll switch over. Uh, to another terminal, and I'll, I'll GDB this. It's, and I'll put a breakpoint on the traits program. I'll try to be, oops, uh, put break on traits, traits function, and I'll run. I'll try to be explicit about what exactly, uh, which line is executing. I'll try to do that for the line that's, that's about to be executed. So I have to go next once to indicate that this line has gotten executed. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm declaring a variable called my traits, which holds which is going to start out being bold. So the, the font that I'm looking at right now starts out being bold. That's the bit pattern, right? And so now how do we use, how do we use these bitwise operators to turn on and off the bits of my traits? Okay, well, here's the first example. Here, I could, let's say I want to turn on a bit. I want to turn on the underline bit. So here I'm using a bit of a shorthand. Uh, I'm using the or equals operator. So this is the bitwise or that we saw on the, on the slide, but I'm combining it with the assignment statement. So this is saying, this is equivalent to my traits, uh, I'll write it real quick, but this is equivalent to my traits equals my traits or with underline. Right, these two lines are equivalent. Okay, uh, I'm gonna, but I'm not gonna actually do it. All right, so let's execute this line. So now that we've gone next, we can look at the value and we can ask, okay, so what exactly is the value of my traits now? So I'll print out my traits and GDB is smart enough here to say, okay, I see that you have this enum and I see that your enum is being used to represent these kind of 
bit patterns, these on-off switches, so I can actually tell you that my traits is currently bold and underlined together. It's even using the bitwise or to indicate that the bits that bold and underlined have been ORed together. Now you might say, okay, well, I want to see what the actual bit pattern looks like, though. I want to verify this line that I have up here. Right? I want to verify this, this math that I'm doing over here. I'm not actually going through all the math, but you know, so I, I put it on the side in case you want to walk through it yourselves. Um, so I can actually ask GDB for that using this P slash T, the T standing for two, like TWO. Um, and I can say, okay, tell me what the bit pattern is for my traits. And sure enough, it comes out to be 101, which makes sense because this, this bit represents bold and this bit represents underlined. Isn't like an int by default eight bits? Yeah, so it's going to be stored by, so a care is by default eight bits, um, and then an int would be more than that. Uh, you're at, so the question is, are they actually being stored as exactly three bits? No, they're not. Uh, they're being stored as something bigger than that. GDB is just not going to show me the leading zeros because they're not that meaningful. It's like if I print it out, you know, if I have the number 12, then I could put a few zeros in front, but I'm not going to. So, um, but that's a good question. That there, there are actually more bits going on behind the scenes. Um, we could even, I could even tell you how many bits there are. I can ask for size of. Uh, so there are four bytes being stored for my traits, which means that there are 32 bits. But it's only going to show me three because these are the only three I'm turning on. Anything else? Okay, so now let's talk about how to turn off a bit. And so here we can combine a couple of the operators we saw. We can combine the not operator with and. And so this, uh, I won't walk through the math, but and not is going to be kind of the pattern that we use for turning off bold on my traits. Right. So I go next, and I print out my traits again. We'll see that now, instead of being bold and underlined together like it was before, now it is just underlined. And we can p slash t it to see the bit pattern. And sure enough, it, that one this one got turned off. So and not is how we're going to turn off these bits. Um, so then, so here's an example where XOR comes in. So I'll speed up a little bit, but okay. Now the next one is if we can we could flip a bit. So XOR is useful here. You know, yeah, we could kind of simulate it with the other bitwise operators, but um, it's very convenient just to say, well, if I just want to toggle or flip the italics, you know, on or off. Then I can just I can use XOR. Right. So now italics is on because it was off before. And lastly, um, the the last example I want to show you is this idea of a bit mask, which is okay. So I can I can I've, I've shown you how to set these bits. I've shown you how to turn them on and off, how to flip them. But how do we actually know if the bits are on? So because we can't address into the bits, we need to use the bitwise operators just to check whether or not the bit is on. And so here I'm creating a mask. And what a mask is, it's going to be a, a couple of, you know, it's a bit pattern that I'm going to, that I want to test against. So I have this mask, which is bold or underline, I guess, you know, and or, or I'm going to probably use them interchangeably. And here I'm going to, I'm going to ask, I'm taking my traits and with mask. And what that's going to do is it's going to test whether or not either bold or underline is on in my traits. And if, and if either one is on, then this value will not be 0. And if neither is on, then this, this value will be 0, and the if statement will not happen. So we can see that this is italics, or with, this is itali uh, my traits is italics and underline. So this should enter the if statement. Sure enough, it does, and it can tell us that bold or underline is on. Right. So that worked out. Questions about any of that example? You'll get lots of practice with bitwise operators and creating bit masks in lab. So I just want to give you an overview of what that looks like, just to give you a sense for 
you know, how are bits, how are bits useful <laughs> as these individual on-off switches? So rather than storing, you know, for example, three booleans, uh, one for is bold on, one for is uh, italics on, one for is underline on, I can put them into these, into a single variable, and I can turn on and off these bits using these, these operators. And when we start doing some kind of later, later work with, with numbers and stuff, we'll have other reasons that we'll want to be turning on and off individual bits. And the way we're going to do that is through these bitwise ops. All right. Questions about that part? OK. So now we've talked about bits as individual kind of units, as individual booleans, if you will, like a true, a true false, and on-off. But now I want to look at, at interpreting these bit patterns as, as actually as numbers. And so I'll start by thinking about them purely as unsigned numbers. So I'll think of them as just all non-negative. And then I'll go on to signed numbers later. So to kind of introduce how exactly we're going to interpret bit patterns as numbers, I'll use an analogy from sort of the decimal world. So if I have the number 567, you may recall from grade school when we talked about when you talked about place value, that we can think of we think of the seven as being in the ones place, we think of the six as being in the tens place, and the five as being in the hundreds place. And instead of writing 100, 10, and 1, I can write them out as uh, 10 to the 0, or powers of 10. 10 to the 0, 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2. And so if I want to get the number 567, we can think of that as 5 times 100, or 5 times 10 to the 2, uh, plus 6 times 10 to the 1, plus 7 times 10 to the 0. Right? Well, we can think of the same process as applying for binary numbers for our bit pattern. So here I've got this bit pattern, right, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. And I've written in powers of 2. Since we are in binary, we only have 0 and 1, so we're going to use powers of 2 rather than powers of 10. And I've written in the powers of, of 2 from 0 all the way out to 7, because they're you know, 8 bits. That's, that's how many powers we get. And we can use the same method of thinking about place value in thinking about these, this bit pattern. So we can say that this bit pattern represents the number 0 times 2 to the 7 plus 1 times 2 to the 6 plus 1 times 2 to the 5th and so on. And if I do the math and I you know, so the, the multiplication is a little bit easier now because we only got 0 and 1. If it's 0, then uh, that power goes away. Um, the hard part here, I guess, is knowing powers of 2. Uh, that's just something, something that's, that, that'll happen. Um, and so I, I've gotten rid of the, the 0 ones, and you can see that what I have left are a 64, a 32, an 8, a 2, and a 1. So that corresponds to 2 to the 6, 2 to the 5th, so on. And then if we add them all up, we get the number 107. So we could say that this bit pattern, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, or 1, 0, 1, 1, represents the number 107. Okay? Questions about that? All right. So that's all fine, and we could, we sure could uh, keep doing this. But there, uh, let me point out a, a key issue here. You'll notice that the number 107 really, like the decimal value 107, really has nothing to do with the bit pattern. It's pretty hard to go from this bit pattern and get to this decimal number. And you can imagine going the other way, which I won't make you do because eh, it's just kind of a pain. You can do it. You, there's a formula. There's a process. But it's kind of annoying. And in general, it's, it's frustrating to have to look at 
a decimal number and say, okay, well, what was the bit pattern for this? Like, what, you know, which bits are on? Um, if we actually, you know, cared about that. And so you say, okay, well, th that's what binary is for, right? So we can just write out the number in binary. But that's not great either, because it's pretty long, and I'm already at, I'm at eight bits, and I'm already running out of space on my slide, right? So I want to, we want a more compact representation of these numbers, but one which can still allow us to think about what the bit patterns, what the underlying bit pattern actually is. So for that, we need to introduce hexadecimal. So here, hexadecimal, which means base 16, shortened to hex, um, it's kind of like decimal in the sense that, you know, we've got some, some digits, except instead of having 10 digits, we're actually going to assign the numbers, we're going to assign the values 0 through 15 a unique digit. So from 0 to 9, it's, it's the same as in decimal. You can see that the decimal and hex columns match for 0 through 9. But once we get to 10, we're going to use the letters A through F. Case doesn't matter. I'll be probably writing most of the things in lowercase. But we'll, be, we'll assign the values A through F. And what this means, and the nice thing about hex, I'll, I'll show you how to, how to use it in a second, but essentially we can look at, so for a value, so if I have the number 15, then I would represent that as F. And then if I have the number 16, then I would represent that as 1, 0. So you can think of this second position here as not the tens place like it is in decimal, but actually as the sixteens place. This 0x part that I'm introducing here is a prefix. Um, this is something that you can use in C, and it's something that I'll, I'll try to stick to in my slides to indicate that the number I'm showing you is in hex, just so that we don't confuse it with something in binary or in decimal. Um, if we put 0x, that means that this value is in hex. All right. And so this is nice because it's a compact representation, just like, just like decimal. You know, it's not using too many more. It's not using any more digits than than the decimal number was. But okay, so what? Why bother? Well, let's go back to the bit pattern for 107 again. So here we've got the bit pattern 0110 and then 1011. And the nice thing about hex, the nice thing about base 16, is that because we are because you know, 16 is a nice power of 2, we can group the bits in this way. We can think of this, our sort of our 8-bit value as being two groups of 4. And we can look at each of these groups separately, and we can either think of looking them up in the table, or we can convert this value to decimal, so we can think of, so 0, 1, 1, 0, uh, that's going to be a 2 and a 4. So then the decimal value is 6. And if we look that up in the table, we see that that's, that's true, that the decimal value is 6. And we can represent this group of 4 bits using one hex digit. And likewise for this group of 4, 1, 0, 1, 1. Look that up in the table. That happens to correspond to the number 11, which is represented as a single character B. So now, if I want to write this bit pattern in hex, I can just write 6b. And there you have it. So very convenient to convert to and from binary, um, when, to convert hex to and from binary, um, which is why, and, and since it's so much more compact, we're pretty much going to be representing every kind of bit relevant constant in hex. So if I, if I want a some kind of constant where certain bits are on, I could, I, you saw already one way of doing that using bit shifts and some bitwise operators. Uh, another way of doing that would be using hex. We're pretty much not going to write out the actual binary because once you get past a few bits, it's, uh, it's unwieldy. Yep. Why is base 16 special? Why did they choose the power of 2? Yeah, so why is base 16 special? Uh, it's a power of 2 and the power of 2, which is so 4, right? 16 is 2 to the 4. And the nice thing about that is that it's also, 4 is then divisible, or divides into 8. So then we can take this one byte, and we can split it into two groups of 4. 
So that's really nice. There are other representations that you might run into. There's like octal, which is base eight. That's cool because it's also a power of two, but then it doesn't split evenly. It doesn't split our byte evenly. So that's why we use hex. Yep. Anything else? Question. Yep. Could you explain again how 16 is? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay, so if you think about 16, uh, I can't. I don't have the bit pattern. Um, here, let me do this. Okay, I'm just going to do a, a quick kind of almost whiteboard thing. So if I want 16 and I want to represent it in binary, right, that's 1 times 2 to the 4, right, and then nothing else. So that's going to be, maybe I shouldn't have decided to do this, but okay, that should have been, that's going to be 1 and then 4 zeros, right? So this is 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 0, sorry, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, and then 2 to the 4 over here. So then we can do exactly what we did with the other number where we, so we think about each of these as having a, a single hex digit. So this one corresponds to 1, and then this one corresponds to 0. Um, sorry, so then, I think I, that went kind of fast, but uh, yeah, so we can think of, now that we've written out the, uh, the bit pattern, we can take each group of four, map it to a single hex digit. We see that 0, 0, 0, 0 maps to 0, and we see that, well, there's an implicit three zeros here, maps to 1, so then we get 0x10. Does that kind of make sense? Um, yeah. And the leading bit ever non-zero? Is the leading bit ever non-zero for which? Uh, for hexadecimal, like 0x. Is it ever like 3x or 1x? Oh, so you're asking like, is the, so that, no, so the, so the convention here is actually just 0x is the thing that you use to say this is x. Yeah. So you're not going to get like a 1x or a 2x. That's not going to happen. Yes. Anything else? Are pointers in hex? Ah, so the question is, are pointers in hex? This is a, actually kind of an interesting question to, to sort of, there's a, kind of a, a deeper question here, which is that it is not the case that 0x6b is really a different number than 107. They're the same number. They're just represented in different ways. So 107, if I, look at the, if I looked at the number 107 in binary, is this. And if I looked at 107 in hex, it's this. But it is the same number. If I write you know, int i equals 107, and I write int i equals 0x6b, I'm storing the same thing in memory. I'm getting the same number. So when we print out pointers, when we look at pointers, it's conventional to use hex because pointers are pretty long, and thinking about pointers in terms of, uh, in terms of decimal would be pretty, pretty messy. So you'll probably consistently see pointers written in hex, but that doesn't actually mean anything special about how they're being stored. So there's kind of a yes and no. Anything else? Okay. So one hex bit pattern that's just always good to know is what the hex value for all ones is for a, a, single, a single byte. So here I've got 1111 and 1111. And so each of these, you can see in the table, maps to f. And so 0xff is going to be the largest, the largest number I can represent using two hex digits or equivalently using one byte. And that maps to the number 255. Uh, just something you, you know. Uh, so, so if I have one byte, then what this means is that that byte can represent any number from zero, you know, if all of these were zero, up to 255. So we get 256 uh, possible bit patterns in a byte. Okay? All right, so I'm going to take a, okay, let's take a little brief digression here. So I've talked about bits as individual units. I've, ta I've talked about looking them at, at them as numbers. 
Um, and now that I've introduced how to look at them as numbers, I can actually do something quickly before I go back to talking more about numbers, which is how to represent characters. So there is a, so you might have, you know, if you've ever tried to print out a single character in GDB, you may have seen GDB give you a, some number followed by the actual character in single quotes. And you might have wondered, okay, so how exactly is the character being stored? If it's, if everything, as, you know, as we claim, if everything is being stored as these binary, you know, these zero, these zeros and ones in memory, then what, then what exactly is the letter A? Uh, or you know the the character A or the the digit nine, and so here is a quick kind of summary of a little bit of, of a few you know of the most important kind of uh, ASCII. So so the, the the system that we're using to store characters is called ASCII. It was standardized a while ago. It it basically covers the uh, English alphabet, the digits, some punctuation, and that's kind of it. Um, it goes from zero through 127, and then everything past that is kind of open open season for uh, people to interpret as they will. Um, there are a few newer standards to represent various other languages and stuff, but it's all kind of a mess, and we're not going there. Um, so, so here's just a, a quick summary of kind of like what the ASCII looks like. So I can show you, I can show you what this means in in GDB, for example. So if I just do GDB, I don't have to use a program. I can just run GDB and ha ask GDB to print me some stuff. So if I ask GDB to print me the letter, you know, M, for example, then we can see that maps to the number 109. Uh, that's not in my slide, but you can add it up if you want. And we can ask GDB, um, here's another cool GDB trick. If I want GDB to print the value in hex rather than in decimal or in binary, I can use P slash X. And we can see what the actual, you know, the, the bit pattern or the, the hex, which is equivalent to the bit pattern, would be for the letter lowercase m. So certainly not expected to memorize the ASCII table. Nobody does. That's silly. Uh, but just a quick little, we kind of a mention, just a nod to, OK, here's how characters work. So when we say in memory, there are the characters Stanford followed by a backslash 0, that's what we mean. You've got you know, the, the character for S, we can look it up in this table, and we write, that, write down that bit pattern, and then for T, and so on. And then the bit pattern for backslash zero is all zeros. Okay? Cool. All right, so back to, back to numbers. All right, back to thinking about binary, back to thinking about how we're going to use, how we're going to use these bits to represent uh, still entirely positive numbers. And as part of explaining, okay, how do I, how do we represent numbers? I should probably just tell you, I, I need to kind of tell you, all right, well, you know, how do we do, so sure, I, I could, we could do the binary, poly, the, we can do the binary polynomial, we can think about the, the powers of two and the conversion from binary to decimal or to hex, but how do we do math then? If computers are really this into storing everything as zeros and ones, how does the computer do math? So here I've got a sort of simple kind of worked out example of the numbers 107 and 58. Um, I'm going to add them together. Hopefully that is the correct number. And here you can see I, I, I'm showing the carry. Right, I'm showing that there's a, there's a carry on the one. There's a carry of a one to the, to the tens place. And what I want to do is go through what this looks like in binary as well. So here, is the, here are the bit patterns for 107 and 58. Uh, the 107 bit pattern you've already seen before. The 58, you may just take my word for it that that's 58. Um, you know, the conversions are not interesting. Uh, so we're just gonna, you know, you, you can you can plug them into GDB and ask it ask it for the for the bit pattern if you wanted to. Or, you know. Okay. So let's let's walk through. So the, what I'm hoping to show you is that the addition in binary is actually kind of the same as it was in decimal. Uh, it's just that there's a lot more carrying. It's just kind of, you know, it's a little bit more work for us as humans to do. Uh, it turns out the computer logic is simpler. So, so let's see how this looks. Okay, well, you do exactly what you do uh, when you normally do 
you know, grade school addition, take one plus zero. Okay, what's one plus zero? It's one. Cool, <coughs> nice, all right. Now we go to the next slot. We've got one plus one. What's one plus one? If you said two, that's not correct, at least not in this world, because we can't write a two here. So, yeah, it's two in decimal, but if I can only write zeros and ones, then I have to represent two in binary, which is one zero. Right, so I'll write the zero here, and I'll carry the one. Okay, and then one plus zero plus zero is one, and then one plus one is, again, two, carry the one, and then we can keep doing it. So lots more carrying, you can see that. Right. But process is the same. Hopefully the answer is the same. We can uh, very quickly kind of just do the math here. We can see that this is, uh, so this is 2 to the 7th, this is 2 to the 5th, 2 to the 2nd, and 2 to the 0th. Don't expect you to do this in your head or anything. Um, I worked it all out ahead of time. Uh, but you can, you can play with the conversions if you want to feel better about the binary, um, uh, the binary to decimal conversions, but here you go. Um, it does turn out to work. Okay? Questions about this? So addition just kind of works out. We can just do the normal thing. Um, you know, I could show you multiplication, but boy, that's just going to be more, more numbers. Uh, but hopefully you believe, at least at this point, that yes, we can represent, we can represent numbers in base 2. We can do math on base 2 numbers, um, on binary numbers. Everything's going to be fine. Uh, the computer can implement this logic, and the hardware takes care of it, and we're all good. Yeah? Okay. One more example of addition, which is maybe a little interesting. So here I've got 255, which, recall, is the maximum value we could store in a single byte, all ones, and I try to add one to it. So what's going to happen? Well, we can go through the same process. Uh, 1 plus 1 is 0, carry. 1 plus 1 is 0. We're going to keep carrying like crazy. And then we get this 1 off on the end here, which gets copied down here. So, okay, seems reasonable, right? Answer is 256. Are we done? Well, we only had space for one byte. Or, or so far, I'm doing everything in terms of one byte numbers, right? So we only have space for one byte. And one byte, space for eight bits. So this last one here cannot fit in my byte. So what happens to it? Well, it falls off. This is what is called overflow. Because what happened is we went over the maximum possible value of a byte. The one that kind of that was supposed to get copied over here got thrown away because it didn't fit. We're not going to get a warning. We're not going to get any kind of indication that this happened. All we will see is that if we took an unsigned care, because that's a one byte number, set it to 255, took another unsigned care, set it to one, add them together, we get zero. All right. So most of math kind of works. Uh, it mostly works kind of the same way, and everything is okay, except for this edge case, which is we only have so many slots to put in to fill our bits. And when we run out, the system will silently throw away the bits that don't fit. So 255 is 255 plus 2. So if we added 2, then this would be 1, 0. So you could work it out, and yeah, you'd actually get 0, 0, 0, 1. It'll, so, so the math will just, it'll do exactly the math. There's no special cases here. It'll do exactly the math, and you just throw away the 1 in front. Throw away the 1 out here. That's it. Anything else? Yeah, so the question is, is this equivalent to modding by 256? Um, yes, essentially, so if we take, uh, yeah, you can think of, you can think of, all right, we've done the math, we, we, we work out the addition, and then we do a, a mod by 256 because that's um, sort of the, that's 2 to the 8th, right? And then we, that's our answer, yeah. 
And so when we try to generalize this for larger int types, then we'll see that that, that generalizes too. Okay? All right. So in light of this overflow idea, now you may recall from grade school that you learned about a number line. You thought about you, you thought about numbers as starting kind of in one, you know, at, at some position on the line, like zero, and then kind of the line extending infinitely outward in one direction, or maybe both directions if we're doing negative numbers, to represent larger and larger and larger numbers. That is not what we actually have in our system. We start, so we only have so many bit patterns. We can't go infinitely out in one direction. So I put all of the bit patterns on this circle. And the reason it's going to be a circle will, be, will become clear later in, in like two minutes. But I've got this bit pattern 0, 0, 0 here. And you know, that represents 0. And we've got 1 and we've got 2. And we can keep going clockwise to get larger and larger numbers. But then when we get to all 1s, and we go one more, then we get this discontinuity. So it is a circle in the sense that, so yeah, I guess if you're, if you're familiar with math and you think about, and you, you, you may have seen this already, you may have seen modular arithmetic as a circle, you may have used some fun, fun happy math terms for that, um, but I'm not going to assume that most of you have. So here you can see that when I get up to this all ones, and I, so adding one on this circle means going clockwise. So if we start at zero, and we add one, we go clockwise one. We add another one, we go here. And we can add, say, you know, 60 something, get here. We can add another whatever um, to keep moving around the circle. But when we add one at 255, we basically jump off the kind of, like sort of this, this little discontinuity point, we get back to zero. So it's not a line, it's a circle. And we can go around the circle kind of as many times as we want, um, but we're not getting a number bigger than 255. Questions about unsigned. So that's pretty much all there is to it for representing unsigned numbers. It's not, you know, it's not terrible. There's a binary polynomial. You, you map the, you map each bit to a power of two, and then kind of call it a day, right? Okay. So now we need to talk about something much more interesting um, and something much more sort of complicated in a in a way, which is. OK, now we want to, all right, so we can represent positive numbers. We can represent 0 up to 255. That's nice. But now I want to represent signed numbers. I want to represent negatives, too. Now, going back to this circle really quickly, just to kind of hammer home the point, we can't just add numbers. We can't just say, OK, well, here's your 256 positive numbers. Here, have another 256 negative ones. We don't have space for that. We're only, we only, we're only using one byte, and that byte has 256 possible bit patterns that can fit in it. And so if we want to use any of those bit patterns to represent negative numbers, then we have to give up something on the circle. We have to not be able to represent some of these numbers if we want to represent negative one, for example. OK, well, so which number should we give up? Uh, probably don't want to give up zero. Probably don't want to give up one or two. So you'll see that we'll decide we're just going to give up this left half. We're going to give up the, the bigger numbers, since 255 is a pretty arbitrary number anyway in terms of you know, that being our maximum. We'll just say that everything kind of on the left-hand side of our, of our circle is going to be used for negative numbers. OK? So the idea, right? So we're going to use half the circle for negatives. And um, here's, a, here's a first attempt at it. So this attempt is known as sign and magnitude. And here's sort of the first thing you might think of if, you, if I told you, OK, I need you to go represent me some negative numbers using these 8-bit eight, eight bit, um, eight bit bytes. You might say, OK, sure. Well, <clears throat> I'll throw away the, the left-hand side of the circle. Well, notice that the left-hand side of the circle has has a 1 in the most significant bit 
in all of these positions, right? So we'll say, okay, how about this? I'll use the most significant bit to represent the sign. So if the, if the bit is 1, then I'll represent a negative, and then I'm talking about a negative number. If the bit is 0, then I'm talking about a non-negative number. And then I've got 7 bits to go, and I'll use those to represent the actual, uh, the, the absolute value. So in this example, uh, if I have negative 1, then you know, the 7 bits here represent 1, and then the MSB, the leftmost bit, is going to be 1, indicating a negative. And so here's like negative 20, for example. Um, these 7 bits represent the number 20. And then there's a 1 in the sign bit representing that is a negative. Okay. So we could do this. Um, it sure is a, it's a valid representation. We could, you know, get some negative, we can get some negative numbers out of it and stuff. But there are a couple problems with it. So this is not how computers actually represent numbers. The first problem that's maybe, you know, somewhat, that's a little more obvious than the second, is that there are actually two zeros in, our rep in this representation. So the bit pattern all zeros sure represents zero, just like it did before. But now if I flip the sign bit, if I flip the most significant bit, now I get what looks like a negative zero. Right? I get seven bits that are zero, so that's the absolute value is zero. And then I have the one on saying I'm a negative, so okay, this is negative zero. But I mean, negative zero is the same as zero. It's kind of annoying to have two different zeros, especially because now I have, when I do comparisons, for example, if I have to say so that a number is equal to zero, now I've got to check for both of these or something. That's not great. The other problem, which is maybe a little bit more subtle, that we'll, we'll, look, at more closely, uh, we'll look at more closely when we talk about what the actual solution is, is that the arithmetic here is actually challenging. Is, it's not outrageously hard, it just requires special cases for negative. Um, the math doesn't just work out. And I need to define what that means, but suffice it to say for now that the, the logic to make sign and magnitude work is a lot, is, is much more than we want. So we're going to explore a different solution instead. Any questions about? at least the, the sign bit part. So we're going to keep with the sign bit stuff. So anything about the kind of basics here? Okay. So let's, let's, so the solution is going to be what's called two's complement. And let me, let me introduce that on the circle. So I'm not going to do any bit patterns. I don't want to do any math. I'm just going to, I'm going to stick to the circle because I think that's sort of the best motivation for it. Okay. So we've already decided that we aren't going to represent the larger numbers of our, you know, we're not going to represent the numbers from beyond, let's just say for now, beyond 127. So we're not going to represent the 255 and the 254 anymore. Okay, we're going to reserve them for negative numbers. And we kind of need to figure out, well, how do we put the negatives onto this circle? Well, let's go over again the intuition for how we do addition in terms of looking at this circle. So if we start at the number 1, let's say, and we add, you know, 63, then that represents going clockwise around the circle, starting here, moving down around here. So if we, and then subtraction would then be going counterclockwise around the circle. So imagine if I were at 127, and I wanted to subtract, you know, 63, then I would go counterclockwise back around here. Right, so or in here, you know, 3, 4, all the way up to 63, and then so on, right? And recall that one of the, the big problem with sign and magnitude that I, I didn't like was that I needed a special case. I needed to do addition and subtraction differently. So what would it take to not do addition and subtraction differently with the negatives? Well, it would mean that if I started at 0, and I subtracted 1, that I would want 
to get to negative 1. And I would want that to be equivalent to moving counterclockwise around my circle by one space. I would want negative 1 here. Right, start at 0. Subtract 1 means move counterclockwise 1. I would want negative 1 here. If I subtract 1 again, well, then I would want negative 2 here. And then if I keep subtracting, then I would, could fill in all the way down. This happens to be negative 64. And I could fill all the way down to negative 127. So what we've gotten from this circle is that, let's worry about this middle part here later. Let's worry about the 6 o'clock space in a second. But if we're staying in the range from negative 127 to positive 127, Addition and subtraction continue to just work just to work exactly the way they used to. If I start at negative 127 and I add 60, well then that's just moving clockwise around the circle by about 60. If I start at negative 60 and I add 100, well that's just moving clockwise around the circle past the zero over here. They look the same if you read the bits. Ah, so the question is, how would C know whether the, the bits represent assigned or unsigned? That's going to depend on the type. Right, so uh, up until now, I've declared, I declared the two cares when I showed you the, that part as unsigned care. If I declare them as signed care, then it will. So, so you're noticing that, yeah, the bit patterns look the same. And that's part of what we want here. We want that the arithmetic for the bits, you know, the arithmetic will work. We want the arithmetic to work regardless of whether we're in signed or unsigned mode. But the interpretation will be different. And how C knows whether to interpret the value as a signed number or as an unsigned number will depend on how I declared the variable. But the bits are the same. The logic for doing the math is the same. The hardware for doing the math is the same. That's nice. Where does it store the type data, though? Ah, uh, uh, that's a good question. It's stored in the code, which we'll talk about next week. Okay. <laughs> Uh, why am I using care instead of an int? Because uh, care is a one byte data type. And so I only want to write 8 bits. Um, we will generalize to int probably next, probably next lecture, probably beginning of next lecture, also a little bit during your lab. Um, so the, so the, I guess, quick, quick overview of C types. So cares, shorts, ints, and longs are all in what we call the integer family. They all kind of follow the same rule of using, you know, the signed and unsigned conventions, the binary polynomial that we talked about already. Um, they all kind of work the same way. So whether I use a care or a short or an int will just depend on, whether, on how big I want the value to be. Do I want it to be one byte? Do I want it to be two? Four for ints, and so on. Anything else? Okay. One more piece that we need for this circle to be complete, which is what do we put at 6 o'clock? Down here. If you come from the right and we move uh, clockwise by one more, you would think that this should be the number positive 128. If you come from the left and you move uh, counterclockwise, then you would expect this to be negative 128. And so we kind of just have to pick one. Well. Our convention has so far been that if the most significant bit, if this, you know, the leftmost bit is a 1, then we want that to be a negative number. So seems consistent to put negative 128 here. However, what this means is that there is now a discontinuity, just like there was in the unsigned circle, but it's at a different place now. It was, it's up, it was up there. Now it's down here. Where if I take 127 and I add 1, I'm going to jump back around to negative 128. And so we actually already saw an example of overflow in the very beginning of the first lecture, where we saw that if I take a number and I make it large enough, then it starts going negative. So that was in the case of multiplication. But the same would happen for addition. And here we know exactly where it happens now. It's at the exact place where 0 all 1s flips over to 1 all zeros. So if I take 127, add 1, we're going to go negative. All right, question about this? OK. 
So let me walk through an example. So I already alluded to uh, the, the circle showing me that addition and other arithmetic hopefully work the same way. Uh, I should probably, I, I, you know, let me actually do the math out for one example just to convince you a little bit that the addition does work out the same way. So here I've got the, I've got the five. So that's the bit pattern for five, right? One, zero, one, four plus one. And then this is the bit pattern for negative two. Uh, for now, we could see that by looking at this circle. That's the bit pattern for negative two. And, um, you know, so, so, but I'll tell you how to actually get the bit patterns in a second. So let's do the math and let's see if five plus negative two actually does come out to three, which is what I sure hope it does. Okay, well, one plus one, zero is one, zero plus one is one. That all, that all is good, right? And then we got one plus one is zero, carry the one. One plus zero plus one is zero, carry the one. And we keep carrying the one and we get to what looks like a, what was before a bad situation. We got to the point where we had this extra one that doesn't fit in our one byte. But now, so just like before, we're gonna throw it away. But as it turns out, by throwing it away, we are left with actually the correct answer. So here, this overflow behavior of, of taking that ninth bit and just dropping it on the floor and leaving us with whatever eight bits we had left will actually work using the same arithmetic logic that we were doing before, the same process for adding up the two numbers, I can get to the number three. That's nice. Same process, doesn't matter if it's signed or unsigned, we can just do it. Okay, any questions about that piece? Okay. So uh, back to the number circle for a second. Now I wanna talk about, okay, so great, we've got the circle and that's all nice, except, I mean, I don't wanna have to look up the circle every single time I want to do, I want to convert you know, a number to its negative. So let's say I was looking at number two, or let's say, you know, let's say I was looking at, yeah, so let's say I was looking at uh, two, and I wanted to figure out what the bit pattern was for negative two. So I have the bit pattern for two, which is this, and I wanna know what the bit pattern is for negative two. We can see that on the circle, negative two is just, the reflection of two across the y-axis. So, you know, drawing a line straight down the middle, um, if we just kind of reflect over y, that's where negative two is gonna be. But what is the relationship in terms of the bit patterns? You'll notice that two and negative two are kind of, they're almost like inverses of each other. Right? It's almost like I took all the bits in two and I flipped them, but not quite. In fact, if I flip them, starting here, um, starting with this bit pattern, if I flipped them, I would have ended up over here. I'd have ended up at negative three, actually. Right? You can see that it's one counterclockwise of, of negative two. Right? So this one would turn into a zero, everything else turns into a one, that's actually negative three. So what we need to do in order to adjust for this is we need to actually add one back in. So we can flip all the bits and get down here, but then we add one so that we move counterclockwise to get back over here. So this is the formula for computing negative x. It's a Pretty handy formula because you don't want to be writing out the circle every time. If I want to get to the arithmetic inverse is one way to call this, um, the, the negative of a number, then I flip all the bits, um, but then I also have to remember to add one. And if you can't remember the formula, but you feel like you can remember you know, one fact about two's complement, it's also pretty much good enough to know that negative one is represented as all ones, so zero x f f, because if negative one is represented as all f's, I could flip all the bits, 
get 0, and then add 1. And so you can rederive the formula by just starting at negative 1 and thinking about what it would take to get to 1. Flip all the bits, add 1. Questions about this? Okay, let's try to apply it. So, uh, you know, maybe a good time for a little audience participation here, which is the question that I would like you to answer is, what do we get when we take negative 128, which recall was, uh, so I'll, I'll switch a couple things. So recall negative 128 was at the 6 o'clock position down here. What do we get when we take the negative of that? Using the formula, what do we end up with? I don't know, just take uh, 30 seconds to a minute to work it out. If you want to work with a person next to you or something, talk it out. Yes, the title of the slide gave it away a little bit. Oops. Put the formula on, <laughs> that's better. What? Oh, sorry, thanks. <coughs> yeah, so you can do it with the circle, you can do it with the formula. Can we try both. Take another 45 seconds. Okay. Uh, let's uh, let's let's uh, let's just take a look here. Uh, I'll put up the answer and then I'll take questions. Um, but I'll I'll walk through it. So we're gonna do the formula. We're gonna apply the formula. So we start negative one twenty eight. I'm writing it in hex and in binary just so we get a comfort for what that looks like. Here's the number straight off of the circle. We'll apply the formula for negative, which is we're gonna flip all the bits. So then we get. 0 followed by all 1s. Then we're going to add 1 to it, which means that we, you know, 1 plus 1 is 0, carry the 1. And we're going to keep carrying the 1 until it gets carried over here. We said, we actually said a little bit already that 127 plus 1, if I go back to the circle, we said that 127 plus 1, there's a discontinuity, we end up back at negative 128. We overflow. So sure enough, We end up back where we started. We end up at negative 128. So if I so negative 128 is its own inverse. There's and, and this is what I mean by an asymmetry there. That there isn't enough, there aren't enough bit patterns to represent positive 128. So we kind of just picked somewhat, you know, just sort of to be consistent that the 6 o'clock position would represent negative 128, and that just means that there is, it has no negative. If you think about negative as reflecting over the y, over the y axis, so you think about um, here, we've got, you know, 0 is its own reflection across y, negative 128 is its own reflection across y as well. 
So it is its own inverse. Questions about that? So let me talk a little bit about signed and unsigned, um, some of the things that are, are nice, and, um, but then a couple of things that may catch you off guard with them. <clears throat> Our goal in designing this signed representation, in designing two's complement, was to make the arithmetic process the same. We wanted that, for example, when I do plus and minus, the same hardware could do both Signed and unsigned. Uh, oh, I forgot to change the slide. OK. Uh, and so in addition to that, signed and unsigned work the same way when asking for whether things are, are equal. So if I, have, if I ask whether two numbers are equal, that's just going to compare the actual raw bit patterns. I don't have to deal with any like double zero or anything like that. So equality is pretty simple too. However, there are a few things that are different about um, between signed and unsigned. One of them is that you'll notice the discontinuity is in a different location. We already saw that on the circle, that um, in one case, in the, sign, in the unsigned case, we went from 255 over to 0, whereas in the signed case, we went from positive 127 to negative 128. So the discontinuities are in different places. Uh, so two other things that you'll spend a little bit of time in in lab and the next assignment. Uh, just a quick nod to the fact that right shift is actually different between signed and unsigned. So I, I know I actually saw somebody asked about this on Piazza like two or three weeks ago. I guess it, I think it is mentioned in in the textbook and all that. But remember when we talked about uh, shifts filling always filling in with zeros? That is not the case for signed numbers. If I have a signed number then the right shift operator will fill in with a copy of the most significant bit. So if I have a negative number and I right shift it, then I just get copies of the one. To f then it ends up filling in with one. If I have a positive number and I right shift it, I'll always fill with zeros. You'll see this in lab. You'll see why this is interesting um, uh, in lab. So um, don't worry if that went too quickly. It's also in the book. Um, and then just kind of a, a nod that here, I'll show, actually show this example, which is that the relational operators, when comparing signed and unsigned numbers, work a little differently. Not only because their logic needs to be a little different, but actually because the kind of the outcome is actually quite, can be somewhat surprisingly different. So last example of the day, we've got a signed int, which is negative 1, and we've got an unsigned int, which is positive 130, and I'm just, I just want to check, is the signed int is negative 1 less than the unsigned int, positive 130. Math says yes, right? Oops, where am I? Oh, oops, here. Oh, well, that's something else. What did I do? OK. Uh, However, there we go. So C says no. C says that's negative 1 is, not, is in fact not less than 130. And the reason, which is, again, you'll see more in lab, is that when I compare an assigned and an unsigned number, we kind of just have to pick one, right? We kind of just have to pick a system to kind of to dominate. We have to pick one of the number circles to use, and C picks unsigned. Why? Because it just picked one. OK. So you'll get lots of practice with signed and unsigned uh, integers and also working with bit-wise operators uh, this week in lab. When we come back on Friday, we will generalize our discussion to not just one-byte numbers, and then we'll move on to floating point. All right.